Hey folks, David Frost, my strategic forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Tuesday, February 19, 2019. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. So we had a three-day weekend, which means that sometimes, and today was evidence of that, trading volume can be very, very light. And therefore, as we know, and I've been saying this for a very, very long time, that the path of least resistance in a light volume trading environment is to the upside. Now, the market really didn't go anywhere today, but we did start down. We gapped down in the morning as a result of the futures trading down overnight, but the market recovered. We're going to talk more about that and the significance of that in a moment. We'll also discuss Friday's big update because the last video that was made here was after Thursday's close. So we had a big update Friday. Here we are basically sideways from where we were or where we closed on Friday. So we're going to talk about all this stuff. We're obviously approaching a very, very important and critical juncture in the market right here, right now. Just a little bit above us, you can see as clear as day that there is resistance here. And the question's going to be, so it's somewhere, and we've been discussing this, 279, 280, 278, somewhere up in this neighborhood, the market is likely to find resistance. We're going to discuss that as well because we always have to keep in mind the trick, trap, fool, and frustrate part of the business. Before we get into any and all of this stuff, let me first thank everybody for participating, posting comments underneath the video each and every night. I love the interaction. I love the banter back and forth. Please continue to do so. In addition, hit the thumbs up button on the video and share the video with anybody that you think can benefit from this information. All right, back to business. So the first order of business is, where did we close today? Did we close above or below Friday's close? And the answer is we closed above Friday's close. Doesn't necessarily have to be an enormous positive, but it can't be a negative. Where did we get to today on the upside? Where was the high of the day? Well, let's take a close look because I think it's important. So the high of the day was 278.58. It's not important to the penny. It's important to where we went. Let's say the high of this breakdown candle is 278.85. So you can see we're right there. We made an attempt. We tested basically on Friday and also today. We've tested the high of the breakdown candle. But here's what's going on and here's what we have to pay attention to. The market has yet to be rejected from the high of this breakdown candle. Sometimes you know that we have to peel back the onion a little bit to see what's really happening underneath the market. Category A is, are we into or close to, one way or the other, what should be a resistance area? And the answer is, yes, we are, but we've already tested the high of the breakdown candle and we weren't even close to being rejected yet. Whether we wake up to a rejection on Wednesday morning or not, that remains a mystery. But nevertheless, when we got there, the market basically, at least thus far, has been invited to stay. So let's go through that for a second. What if the market is invited to stay up here? What are the possibilities? Well, we have some near-term possibilities, and one of them is to fill the gap. So the gap officially gets filled in my book at 279.30. That's not that far away from where we are now. Then you have the high up here, which is at 280.40. So there still is a lot of what we like to call overhead resistance. Let's go through some different scenarios for argument's sake. So on the upside, we know that we're into resistance, but within the next, let's say, 20 S&P handles or so, there is resistance. So we can go to the top of this pivot right here, which on the spider is 280.40 and anywhere in between. We can also go to the downside. Let's talk about that for a second. And then by the way, there is a third scenario. Let's talk about the downside. So what we're going to do and what my inside the numbers members knew this morning was the bogey on the downside was basically Friday's low. As long as we maintain the level above Friday's low, the market was going to stay bullish, and it did. 
We started down. They turned it around. We finished at least positive for the day. And other markets were actually up nicely for the day as well. So all in all, it was a positive takeaway from the day. That's what happens in an uptrend. In an uptrend, they buy the dips. And when you see them buy the dips, it confirms the uptrend. And in light volume, the path of least resistance is higher. And therefore, you can make some money buying the dips in an uptrend if you know what you're doing and you know the price levels that are appropriate to buy. Let's continue discussing the other side, the downside for a second. What happens if we do break below Friday's low? That's a problem. The bears will likely want to go fill the gap, which also coincides roughly with the 200 period moving average. We'll call it 274 for argument's sake. There's quite a bit of white space between where we are now and filling that gap on the south side of town. What about that third scenario? The third scenario is what happens if the current resistance really isn't resistance, at least in the near term? Let's say for a couple of days we start to push higher. Where can the market go on the upside? We did discuss the fact that there's another breakdown candle high, which resides all the way up here. Is that what's likely to happen if we push through this pivot top right here? Or I should really say all three pivots, right? So there are three pivots that are all generally in the same spot. Do we go all the way to the next breakdown candle high, which happens to be... 286.91 we'll just round it and say 287 is the market going to get sucked up like a vacuum all the way to 287 another 100 s p handles another 10 spy points unlikely anything can happen it's unlikely but the question really is what is that spot in between what really should be current resistance and that breakdown candle high where would the market likely find that resistance point in this area where there was a huge down day? How do you find the zone where the market would likely, A, get attracted to like a magnet if we get above this pivot high, right? If we get above the high of 280.40, the market's likely going to get sucked up a little bit. You're going to see some short covering occur. You start to get hourly closes above there and people start to get concerned. People that are short the market begin to get concerned. So you will see about a short covering. Where would that take the market? Well, that's my story. And that number resides or that horizontal trend line resides around 283 even. Could it be 283, 50, 60, 70, 282, 90? Of course. I'm giving you an area I think the market can actually get sucked up to in a vacuum scenario, but at the same time, come up short of the breakdown candle high. Now, this is all meant to be taken in the short term. What happens three Thursdays from now, we're not talking about that. I'm discussing what's happening this week. So we'll make that into a red line. We'll leave it there. We'll see what happens and if it happens, it's a big if, right? I don't have a clue if the market's going to get to 283. But what I do know is if the market got to 283, 283 and a half, up in that zone, that is likely another area of overhead resistance. That line is meant to be a what if scenario. And the what if is if we get above the pivot of 280, 40. And if any of this happens, I'll make a video for Inside the Numbers members and I'll explain exactly how I came up with that number. Speaking of Inside the Numbers, we'll do a quick review of what happened today. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can take a snapshot or read this, pause the video, whatever. Pre-market notes, I'll just scroll it up a little bit so you can read the whole thing. Basically, what I was saying is if the buy the dip crowd comes in, they're going to rally the market. Here's what to watch out for on the downside. Here's where they're not coming in. And here's the line in the sand or the bogey, as I like to call it. And here's what the likely scenario is. If they did come in, how high would the market go? Then we get up to the midday uh, release or the midday 
update today came out at about 1140 and as suspected the market was quiet and pretty much was on par it did everything we discussed and then we had one trade today i'm not going to go through the laundry list of trades that didn't happen lulu was a trade it worked out the market was quiet the stocks that we identified that were on the move this morning just never got to the target prices that i would have been willing to take a trade at but just to give you a snapshot of what's going on in this uh, report here, morning gap trades, there was nothing that qualified to be a morning gap trade this morning. But we do have stocks on the move. Nothing hit its target except Lulu. CLR shows yes in the entry hit column, but it actually opened below the first target. That's why it shows yes, but it took it off the table, rallied anyway. But it was a no trade as far as I was concerned. So Lulu was the only trade that triggered its target price. It did work out. We can take a look at that chart real quick. Nothing special. It is what it is. The stock closed up here the prior trading day. Opened down a little bit. Not a tremendous amount, but it was a trading opportunity on a very quiet day. I'll take one over none any day. So what happened is the 147.75 stock came into that price bounced higher within minutes we were at 148.69 so we'll call it a dollar for argument's sake off that price level then the stock went lower and rallied back toward that price level at the end of the day it did come up short of the second price target the second target was 145.07 i believe and the low was 145.53 quiet day either way my favorite market leading indicator, the IWM, both in the up and the downward direction. Where are we headed? It looks visually like we're headed to the 200 period moving average. The IWM did lead today. It was up one third of 1% while the spider finished slightly between zero and that. So you can't make a big deal out of it because the markets really didn't move that much one way or the other. But what you can also see is not only is the 200 period moving average coming up but look what else you have coinciding with the 200 is this pivot right here also you have another one right here so the market is telling you the IWM chart is telling us that these price levels are important you have a pivot here a pivot here you have a 200 period moving average it's unlikely that we're just going to waltz right through this area whistle past the graveyard now when I discuss that what we have to keep in mind is the trick, trap, fool, and frustrate crew. For a day or so, we can certainly probe above the area. However, are we likely to find ourselves in the IWM at 170 next Wednesday and continue going higher? No, that's not likely. That's an unlikely scenario. Just keep in mind, the market is unlikely. Listen to this one. It's unlikely to do the obvious thing. Right here, the obvious thing is to hit the 200 period moving average, get rejected, and go down. That's what most traders would look at on a chart like this and think that was what was likely to happen. So we have to think in terms of, well, we know what's likely to happen. We see what's obvious. We see what other folks are looking at. We have to look under the covers. We have to look under the hood a little bit. We always want to find the things that other people don't see that's how you win the game the transports the transports were actually up more than the IWM which was up more than the spider so that's a good indication for the bulls so the transports the IWM my two favorite market leading indicators the transports comes in second IWM comes in first so the transports look like they're headed to fill the gap the gap is right here up at 10 840 something it's actually 10,850 and something. Again, maybe it fills the gap and gets rejected. Maybe it comes up short and gets rejected. Maybe it goes higher. It's likely all these markets are going to follow each other down the path. If they're all going higher, they're all going higher. If one peaks out and gives a signal of a reversal, my antennas are up, obviously. They're all going to eventually follow suit, but they don't necessarily all have to top out at the same time that's why i watch multiple markets we've been down this road before this is not my first rodeo looking over in silicon valley we got the triple q's what are we doing here in the triple q's well 
You know that I always like to tell you or point out to you, I shouldn't say tell, I should say point out. I like to point out what the first thing my eye is attracted to visually on the chart. And the first thing that my eye is attracted to on the cues is the fact that we made a run for the 200 period moving average, pulled back for a couple of days, made a nice bottom. We remember that that was on a Friday and then we made another attempt and now we've been fooling around with the 200 period moving average, also known as consolidating right around it on top, right under it in order to build some energy to make another push higher. Where's that push higher going to likely take us? Right to this pivot top, which is only a few cents away? Unlikely. We have a gap that's right here above 174. We have another pivot that's at 175 and a half, give or take. And then we have another gap. So any of those areas may be final destination for the queues for now. We don't know exactly which one. We're going to wait to see which market I'm waiting to see which market is going to be the first to its final destination and the first one to indicate that it's turning around. It may or may not be this week. We'll see. Looking over in the financial district, same story that we just discussed in all the other markets. It just looks slightly different. We're approaching the 200 period moving average. There's a gap up here. There's a breakdown candle high right here. There's a lot of stuff going on with the XLF. So there are a lot of places that it's headed. One of those places is acting as a magnetic force. And one of those places will draw the market to it and be the final destination. Taking the XLF out of the equation for a second, just looking at a chart like this, let's say it was blank. Let's say it was XYZ stock. What would be the ideal shorting territory on a chart like this? Right there. That pivot top is roughly 27 and a half. You have a backstop right here, right around 28. And if you close any day above 27 and a half, you're out of the trade. That's your risk. So let's say that in this particular case, we are talking about the XLF. But I want to take the XLF out of the equation because I want to make it crystal clear. I'm not saying short the XLF. I'm just saying this is a potential trade setup. I'm giving you a lesson. Forget about where the market is or isn't today. Let's just think in terms of this is a lesson. It's a chart lesson. The high of this pivot is exactly 27.47. So let's say that this particular stock came up to 27.35, 27.40. You can consider taking a short. And let's say the stock closed the following trading day at 27.68. I'm making up a number. You move out of the trade. Look what your risk was. You knew where you were wrong. You lost small and fast. And you can actually make another attempt right at the breakdown candle high around 28 if you'd like to. The second way to do it is to take a portion or a partial position on the first attempt if the stock or if in, in this case this particular chart went up to 28 you could put on the second portion or another portion of that trade and you've averaged the position there are a lot of different ways to trade these markets i just wanted to throw out a lesson i'm not saying one is better or worse than the other just doing a lesson throwing some ideas out giving you an idea of how to look at a chart know where the trade is and where it is because you're right in an area that's close to risk. If you're going to be wrong, it's wrong, small, and fast. That's the whole idea. I always get requests to discuss Apple, so I will discuss Apple. There's not a lot to discuss. The daily chart is okay. As long as we're around this area above the 20 and 50 period moving average, it's not really that bad. In order for Apple to move higher, for example, if it's going to move higher into this area of the 100 period moving average, this gap up here, 183, 184 area, it has to have more time on the clock. So therefore, it's not uncommon that Apple's going sideways. I'm not surprised Apple's going sideways. It could certainly move higher, but what I see when I look at a weekly chart this is where you say, well, you see what's containing the price right now is the 100 period moving average that we've basically traded into. 
That's the overhead resistance right now, as well as from a weekly chart basis, you have the 20-week moving average sloping down. So for Apple to get above 175, it's a challenge. And even if it does, where is it headed? It's headed to test the breakdown candle high. That's at 184, 185. So in between 175 and 185, there's a lot of overhead resistance, but magnetic forces, if you will, should draw the market up in that area if we can get above 175 at least on a daily chart closing basis. That's not that easy right now. Going back to the daily chart, that's right here. You have to get above these highs that we just were at on the 6th, for example, the 6th this month, a couple of weeks ago. And basically, Apple's been treading water as the market's been going higher. So what does that tell you? It tells you there is no relative strength in Apple against the overall market. Apple is lagging the market. That's not a positive. That's a negative. That's the way I interpret the chart of Apple today. What's going on over here in gold? So we were talking about picking up gold around the low 1300s. I was talking about the fact that I would love to get it around 1300. Not sure it was going to get there. 1304, 1305. We discussed that a few times. And I said, and I've said this before many, many times, doesn't even matter what chart we're looking at, that when a stock or a commodity or a chart, it doesn't matter what it is, an instrument is not able to reach a target, whether it's on the up or the downside. So in this case, wasn't able to reach what I thought was a target on the downside. That's bullish. Look what happened. Took off to the upside. Kept above the moving averages. This was bullish. It was consolidating. It was making bullish consolidation. We talked about it. I didn't do anything with it. We talked about it. Had no idea we would get this kind of move this fast out of it. I don't pay that much attention to gold. But nonetheless, what a tremendous move up $22. Now, somebody's going to read into this and say, well, the fact that gold is rising means the market's going to collapse. And that may be right. But we take each independent chart in and of itself. I analyze every chart by itself. So where are we headed in gold? Well, we're at pretty decent resistance, give or take a couple of bucks right here. The next major area is all the way up at 1365. So if we can break above 1350, I think 1365 should come in pretty short order. And when I say break above, you got to start closing hourly above those price levels. And then we have crude oil, and there are no surprises. We've been bullish crude oil. We had that little dance step down to test the 50-period moving average. Look what happened ever since. We're headed to 57. We've been talking 57.50, actually, I think. We've been talking about that price level for quite some time. It's still on the table. It remains on the table. It's nearer on the table than it was before. We're going to get to 57.50 and likely higher. And that's about all I have, folks. So I'm going to give it a wrap here. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.